Great. Welcome to all of you. Um, we apologize. We're running a little behind here, but uh, it's good to, to be hosting this. I'm Akiko Fujita. I'm an anchor and reporter at Yahoo Finance. And today we are talking about America's resolve, examining U.S. leadership around the world, really looking at the last two years um, and the pandemic to see how that has been a real test case for the role the U.S. sees in shaping the global response, whether it's in vaccine development and distribution, whether it's in guiding the economic recovery, or looking down the road here and really leading on issues like climate change. Um, over the next 45 minutes, we're going to be looking at the role the U.S. has played internationally, but also looking at how much of those policies uh, have been reflected in what we're seeing play out here domestically, whether it is on the pandemic or climate change. And we've got a great panel for us uh, over the next 45 minutes. We've got Zoe Baird here, president of Markle Foundation. Uh, we've also got Deborah Wentz smith president of the U.S. Council on Competitiveness. Uh, Steve Case, unfortunately, could not make it today. He's not feeling well, um, but uh, we will have to have a discussion uh, between two, you two ladies <laughs> in his place. Um, we're going to get to the U.S. leadership on the pandemic in just a bit, but but I think that it's inevitable that we have to talk about what is playing um, out in Eastern Europe. Obviously, all of us have been following uh, the Russian invasion on Ukraine. Uh, this is yet another issue that has raised questions about where the U.S. leadership is. In, in many ways, it feels like we have seen this unprecedented unity between the U.S., President Biden, and leadership over in Europe as well. Um, so I'd love to kind of get your thoughts. And, and I'm not asking you to weigh in on geopolitics per se, but Deborah, let me just start with you on how you've been viewing this through your prism. Well, th thank you. And let me say how delighted I am to, to be on this uh, panel with uh, Zoe Baird. It's nice to see you again. And again, I want to congratulate Frank for a fantastic um, U.S. Horasis meeting and, and look forward to when we're all together in person. Um, I'll just start out by saying that, you know, when we're looking at the issues that are terrible tragedy unfolding in Ukraine and and Eastern Europe writ large and Europe as a whole. I mean, the United States is obviously very much at the center of this because we were the nation that put together the security framework after World War II. And, you know, it really worked very well, um, even through the end of the Soviet Union. But in recent years, we've seen many nations in Europe who really did not make their contributions to NATO, did not take NATO as seriously as they should have. Um, and I think when you couple that to a resurgent Russia, very uh, economically powerful because of two things, energy, um, energy, uh, fossil energy, but also the fact that the European nations, particularly Germany, became very dependent on Russian um, oil and gas and created a very a, a huge vulnerability that's compounded by their and other countries in Europe, lack of commitment to their collective national security. And in the case of, um, I'll just mention, and I know we're going to discuss this vis-a-vis -vis the United States, the United States' leadership globally depends on our strength domestically. Hmm. And the two are very much inter interspersed. You can't really divide one from the other. And I think with all the, the uh, issues that are going on in the United States, our political divide, uh, the kind of extremism on both sides of, of the political fence, we've conveyed to the world that we haven't been taking our global leadership responsibilities seriously. And yes, this is true now with Ukraine, but very much true with, true with China. And in fact, I think perhaps one of the most serious things in, beyond the tragedy of what's happening in the Ukraine, and you know, I'm one of the people that's praying that you know, they're, they're going to be able to, to maintain their... Uh, defenses with equipment and things coming in from uh, NATO countries as well. But China's sort of, you know, we hear China's waiting on the fence. Uh, the conversation and the agreement between Putin and Xi during the Olympics, uh, don't do anything until after the Olympics. And China's, you know, thinking, gee, we could move in and do things too in our backyard. So this is, this is very serious. But 
um, I think yeah. we have to see a revitalization of collective security and the U.S. play a leadership role in that. Well, into your point on China, you know, there's still questions, I would argue, that um, that that we don't quite know where China stands. They sort of tried to play the middle ground here while they did. We did have that meeting between President Xi Jinping and President Putin prior to the Olympics. Since the invasion has begun, uh, they have sort of tried to not necessarily be pro-Russia and also say that we are with the Ukrainian people. And that's going to be an interesting dynamic to play. But before I move on here, um, Deborah, to just kind of follow up on your point about when we are strong at home, we are strong internationally. To what extent do you think a conflict like this could really uh, strengthen the alliance that some would argue was a little fragmented um, in the previous administration? There are also questions about whether there is a commitment to NATO. Um, it feels like the last several weeks, we have seen a unity, unlike something we haven't seen over the last several years. Yes, I think it is going to strengthen that unity. And I think also what's come to the forefront, and, and we're going to talk about energy, I'm sure, is that we have technological capabilities now. I mean, this is the first digital war. Um, the cybersecurity implications are huge. And so our collaboration in these forefront areas, whether it's artificial intelligence, next generation microelectronics, we have to do this in partnership with our allies in Europe. And I would also say our allies in other parts of the world. You know, the Quad is so important. One of the first things President Biden did was to re-emphasize the importance of that alliance between the U.S., Australia, India, Japan, very, very critical in terms of technological capabilities as well. So I do think um, that we're going to see much deeper cooperation in areas that perhaps we're seeing as more competitive. But we know, I mean, the cybersecurity aspect of this is huge. And China's a very bad actor in cybersecurity. I mean, I, I, I know this well from the work I do. I'm on the Commission for the Theft of American Intellectual Property. It's massive. So our collaboration and technology statecraft is going to be very, very important as well going forward. And on the energy issue, we are moving forward on climate and decarbonizing our economy's dematerialization, but it's a transition. And, you know, the fact that Germany became a, a big importer of coal, the cost of energy in Europe, two to three times the United States. And we are energy rich and abundant. We could have given long-term leases to Germany for American natural gas. But instead, we didn't export it. And, you know, Putin got the chokehold on energy for Europe. But back to the core thing, yes, I think we're going to be stronger. We're going to be much more in sync about what we need to do to secure a democratic future for everyone in the world. Yeah, and, and on your point on energy, no question, there's going to be a robust debate about uh, which way things should head, especially in countries like Germany. Does this accelerate the move uh, to uh, green uh, renewable energy, or is it going to be reliant on some other countries in terms of natural gas, too? I want to welcome our third panelist who just joined uh, here. It is S. Ramadori, chairman of Tata Institute of Social Sciences. Um, he is joining us. Uh, welcome to you as well. Um, Zoe, let, let's sort of back up a bit here and, and talk about where things stand in terms of the pandemic. Um, this has really been a test of global leadership, not just U.S. leadership, but we're kind of getting to the point, at least here in the U.S., where we are starting to see the recovery take hold. We just had a really strong jobs number that came out today, 678,000 jobs that were added, unemployment at, what, 3.8 percent now. Um, talk me through how you have viewed the trajectory um, over the course of the pandemic and what you think that says about where U.S. leadership is. I'm happy to do that. I think the alliance issue that you were talking about a minute ago is an enormously important part of this because one of the things that became abundantly clear, if it hadn't been before, was just how interdependent our economies are around the world, whether it's supply chain issues or um, other uh, issues of um, uh, economic interdependency. And we have 
gone through an extraordinary disruption. We couldn't have anticipated that we could have um, had as much of the economies of the world shut down. And now as we're coming back, we have an opportunity um, to bring back our economies with more intention around what they will look like and how broad the benefits are um, in the future. When we came out of the Great Recession in 2009, we had no uh, effort to bring people who were most disrupted by that, uh, women, people of color, back into the labor market in a stronger position. And consequently, the economic divide um, accelerated. Um, some people really benefited from the economic growth, but in a very small um, set of, of most countries' population. And Others uh, did not, and the economic divide became even larger. So we have the opportunity now with this degree of disruption to think about how we make these investments in a way where we really can rebuild the middle class, where we can create more economic opportunity, uh, value the work of a broader number of workers. In the U.S., we have 100 million workers who do not have a four-year college degree. It's a staggering number. 70% of our labor force does not have a four-year college degree. Yet for the last decade, we've been telling everybody, go to college and you'll succeed. And it just hasn't worked for most people. So we need to be thinking about how do we um, drive the opportunity for people in a digital economy that takes advantage of the capacities they have. So if somebody is, you know, really good at taking apart a car engine and learn to do that in their neighbor's garage, they would be a great candidate to repair robots, a place where we really need more workforce. Um, but we don't have a labor market or an education system which values those many ways in which people create the capacity to be valuable workers. And consequently, um, the increase in the bachelor's requirement as a prerequisite or the fact that we only look in the sectors where people have worked before, not the sectors that might have prepared them to move into a new job. Um, consequently, we're facing a crisis right now of difficulty in uh, finding workers. So I'm always optimistic, but I believe it's going to take um, real intention to get people back into the labor market uh, more successfully and to meet the needs um, of uh, employers in order to feed the business growth. And I think, you know, we, we want to talk about how you create that equitable system. What does that look like? But but I want to bring in Mr. Ramadori into the conversation too, before we sort of look at solutions beyond the pandemic. Um, talk to me about how you have been looking at global leadership, the U.S. role in it, um, especially during this pandemic? I think a uh, very warm welcome to all of you, including the panelists. I think the 1.9 um, trillion American rescue included 1.1 billion support, the global COVID-19 response of which uh, 4 billion went to Gavi and the Vaccine Alliance, which is the largest donor by far. So that's one very, very positive outcome that came out of this. The second point I wanted to make was collaboration to come out with the vaccine within the shortest possible time through a digital platform was one of the finest, even though we all were doing a remote working. I think that made a big difference. The only thing I would I like to see is a lot more vaccine available in an equitable manner to every part of the world because till the last person is vaccinated, we are going to have a problem of multiple variants coming and uh, circling around the globe. When you look at uh, the wave one or wave two, that is where the maximum uh, migration or deaths or uh, gory scenes played out. But by the time we came to the wave three, I think we all learned and then the speed at which the vaccination, the booster, the second dose of the vaccination played out very, very well. I think one is the positives are collaboration of the highest order. 
the American government and the Gavi Alliance and the health authorities in the country in India, which I live, is an amazing scale problem being addressed with regard to vaccination. Now, as it flows into the next level of uh, the population, whether the children or the adults up to the 18, 20 age profile, it's beginning to show up. As a result, the masking and the social norms are being followed and people are also not educated during this period. To me, wish we had done the collaboration early, wish we had given the access to medicine in an equitable manner. The migration led to a lot of problems in the MSME sector, the micro, small and medium enterprises, where the job creation has to take place very, very clearly. If that job through financing and through the supply chain disruptions are not addressed, the divide between the rich and the not so rich is going to be very pronounced and that can lead to social challenges and the various parts of the world where we are seeing either due to the war induced uh, migration or migration because of the pandemic, I think world as a problem and leadership of Americans and the other parts of the world, whether through quad or any other mechanisms, beyond the collaboration in the different sector has to play out in the social sector and the social consciousness has to be awakened and that's where the social consciousness institutions like the Tata Institute of Social Sciences all have to play a very critical role. That's why I would say here is an opportunity yeah. but you cannot let go of the opportunity. On that specific point you made about this divide that we've seen between the rich and poor countries, you know, here in the U.S., we often talk about things coming out of the pandemic on the road to recovery. And yet we often forget that there are still a lot of developed countries who don't have the full access to vaccines. Do you see that divide getting even greater as we enter the third year of this pandemic? Or have we now learned the lessons and will there be more equal distribution? When I look at the divide in a country like ours and within the globe, it's definitely the divide is increasing. The divide is not only increasing, the problems of acute uh, climate related uh, issues are also surfacing in a very pronounced manner. Whether it is access to water, access to food or access to medicines, you name it, we are having challenges in that. But I think the political system in various parts of the world are beginning to respect the cause that terms are limited if they don't address some of these issues. More importantly, the citizens and the volunteers, the haves, have started pitching in. And the younger entrepreneurs who are starting these social enterprises are playing out very, very well. India is an example. The largest number of startups after, India, after the US and China and the number of unicorns that have been created, more importantly, in the social sector is becoming very visible. I hope the future generation, named the younger generation, are going to be a part of this, uh, addressing this most critical issue, namely the digital divide. And I think uh, we need to propagate it more and more and more to make sure the measurement systems are there, where it touches the people and the impact we create are a lot more visible. I'm hopeful, but at the same time concerned if we do not address this single issue, we're going to have some challenges going forward. Um, I want to see if we can move the conversation sort of inward, at least here in the U.S., and pick up on that point, Deborah, that you made about in order for the U.S. to lead, the U.S. has to be strong at home. And Zoe, you mentioned an interesting stat here about how many workers actually have college degrees. And we have heard the president over and over talk about, if we're going to come out of this stronger, it's gotta be more equal. What does that labor s system look like, the market look like, and what's missing in order to get there? Well, sorry, go ahead and then I'll jump no, in. No, no, you go ahead, Deborah. I'm sorry, I wasn't clear who she was addressing the question to. Please go well, ahead. I, I would build on your excellent comments that you made about skilled labor. and. You know, one advantage we have in the U.S., even though it's a smaller percentage of our workforce, is we have some very outstanding skilled labor unions that do tremendous training in regions. I'll, I'll just single out two, the United Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, you know, fantastic union, the training they do. I mean, people that go through their programs come out with jobs, you know, making $100,000 a year, similarly pitfitters and plumbers and others as well. So, um Companies are also collaborating very well with the unions in training the digital skills that almost every job requires now. You know, the, the digital literacy is the equivalent of, of writing in a different generation. 
So I think this network of training labor unions, companies, and community colleges play a huge role in this. But one of the issues really is that we, as a, as a society now, um, you know, if you ask people, well, what do you want your child to do? How many would raise their hand and say, well, we, we'd love our son or daughter to work in a manufacturing plant. Very few will say that. And yet those jobs are highly sophisticated. They pay well. They, they are much better than, you know, many of the jobs you'll get with a four-year uh, college degree that doesn't give you any skills in order to be employed. But what I really want to pivot to is that with our low productivity in the U.S., and our levels actually higher than other parts of the world, we have to have new engines for growth and productivity and inclusive prosperity. And it's only going to come from doubling down and focusing on innovation. We need, you know... The Council on Competitiveness is called in our National Commission um, on Competitiveness Frontiers, 10 times the number, tenfold the number of innovators, 10 times the increase, 10 times the scale and scope. And in order to do that, we're going to have to have a whole of country approach. And we can't just have the pockets of innovation be in the east and west coast of our country. We need to move completely into our country and ensure that we're building the innovation clusters, the training, the capabilities throughout our country in order to have the inclusive prosperity and standard of living that we desire as Americans. Um, Zoe, you, through the Markle Foundation, have established this WeWork America Alliance, uh, which is essentially this collaboration of low and middle wage jobs for workers from low middle wage jobs. And the idea here, especially for those people of color, um, to, to move on to better jobs. Talk to me a bit more about that structure and what that says about what needs to be fixed in, fixed in the system that exists today. Well, looking at that situation we were confronting with the high unemployment from COVID and the memories of what we'd failed to do in 2009, we pulled together this collaboration of civil rights organizations like Unidos US and Goodwill and NAACP, businesses like IBM and Microsoft and McKinsey and enterprises like the Atlanta Fed and a whole range of um, employers, nonprofits, and educators. And people have been working really hard together. This is not just signing a piece of paper. They've been really working hard together. Um, we're trying to support 10 cities. And the objective is to uh, take the insights that we were able to develop into the job histories of 29 million people that we found who had been in low wage roles, but had the experience necessary to succeed in higher wage, good jobs, with jobs which we call gateway roles. And um, we identified 77 occupations that were proven springboards, these gateways to really good destination jobs. So in and of themselves, they paid well, they were better uh, jobs and required training. Uh, the skills that gave you uh, and the experience that gave you training for the um, later jobs that are really destination jobs. But what we found as we've been working on this, and so we advise uh, coaches and counselors what these jobs are. So as workers come in, they can see what opportunities that they have rather than going to uh, an, another low wage dead end job we've been working with employers to have them see that people coming out of these lower wage jobs are great candidates for them even if they don't have the bachelor's degree or the traditional credential and we've been trying to encourage employers to collaborate with trainers like community colleges or a lot of tech companies themselves provide uh, enormously valuable training and so we've been trying to rework the labor market if you will in a way which is really intentional, which is based on data, um, and which inspires uh, the local collaboration supported by this national network of organizations. And um, we're really trying to scale this up. There are many good things of this type going on. Um, ours, you know, is cutting across a lot of occupations and a lot of um, locations. Um, and we're hopeful 
that this will create um, the opportunity for people to move into better jobs as they're coming back into the labor market. Now, there's some big obstacles we still have to address. There are too many women standing out of the labor market because we haven't figured out how to get our child care system working. Um, there are too many people who don't have opportunities where they live to get into better jobs. And so uh, there are a lot of problems, but um, I think you see people coming back into the labor market at higher wages. And mm -hmm. my own view is that will be sustained because we don't have, um, or the opportunity for that will be sustained, whether or not it is in every single job, because we don't have um, a situation where technology has replaced people automation and technology that has been transformative on an accelerating basis during COVID still is by and large working alongside um, workers. And I'm happy to talk more about that. But the need, not just in our country, but in others for a really vibrant, um, successful workforce is, should be, and I believe is a common need between the workers and our hope for economic growth. I know we've got quite a few people um, who are in the room right now, and I just um, we were about 50, we got about 50 more minutes to go. But if you've got any questions, feel free to put them in the comment section. We're going to try to get to them in just a bit. I wonder, we, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. Can I make a small comment, please? Yes, of course. Yeah, I think the whole idea of the vocational education and the dignity and respect for the vocational education has become very, very center stage. Across the world, the respect for plumbers, masons, electricians, bricklayers, etc., etc., has become very pronounced and the wages and the salaries are comparable to any of the other disciplines. The digital technology and the platform that makes it work and also the work from home during the COVID period has made this very possible. And the pathways have been established from the mainstream education to the vocational education and vice versa. With the little we can get a diploma, an advanced diploma or a degree along with the regular education and the collaboration has become very, very pronounced. The aspirational job and some of the social norms that you are a plumber, you are down in the society is disappearing very fast. With the result, the respect for the vocational education has taken center stage, and that's the biggest hope as I see it. So the digital technology has become an integral part of that. Women working from home has become very possible, and work at a time that is suitable to them. So the number of people coming into the mainstream is very visible. That's what I wanted to make a point. Thank you. Um, Zoe, let me just follow up on what you said, too, because I, I think we sort of merge these two ideas. It is interesting that on the one hand, we're hearing that um, the way in which we work that has shifted, that has allowed more people to come into the workforce in segments that perhaps would not have been possible. Tech is one that's often mentioned um, because of the geographic concentration that we've seen, at least here in the U.S. But you mentioned that you have conversations with some of these companies, essentially saying it, it, you don't necessarily have to have a four year degree. And I'm curious what you hear from those companies. And how do we get to a point, at least here in the U.S., where you don't necessarily need to have a four-year degree to be able to build the kind of generational wealth we've seen with those people who go to college? And, and Zoe, the question is to you. It's very interesting because we actually run training programs for employers on how to move away from those kinds of credentials that are obstacles to hiring, particularly if you are interested in diversifying your workforce and bringing in black and Latino workers, you need to open the aperture to the extent you, greatest extent you can of people who would be good fits for your job. And so we found a lot of interest on the part of employers of all sizes in learning how to change the way they look for talent. And then we've created tools to make it easy. So we um, worked with uh, one of the really good data companies and developed a resume builder that allows people to put into the resume builder 
what they've done before and turns that into a skills-based resume so that they can go to an employer and show the employer that they have the skills that the employer is looking for. And then we train employers on how to write skills-based job descriptions. So then those things can be matched up electronically on websites like Indeed and Google and others. Um, so the, um, Transformation is, I think, as as um, was said by one of the other panelists, of real interest on the part of some people. It is not uh, comprehensive. It's not universal. And interestingly, with large employers, they tend to try changing one job at a time. You know, there it's not like the HR department's been told take a whole category of jobs at this layer of the organization and figure out how to make the change. The other thing I would say is some of the governors in the U.S. are really moving on this and are hiring for the state based on skills and eliminating these credentials. And in the president's State of the Union address, he talked about skills-based hiring. And I think um, part of what was intended there was looking at how the federal government itself um, might be able to change the way it hires. And it's so important because otherwise, when you're an employer and you're looking for someone to do a job, you look for somebody who's done that job before, or you look for somebody who um, has the bachelor's degree because you think that is necessary to reflect a certain amount of ability to perform in a work environment. And, um, you know, as I said, 70% of the American workforce does not have a four-year degree. Um, I, I, we only have 10 minutes left. So I want to pick up on another point that I think really speaks to how the U.S. is, is shifting domestic policy to try and lead on more global stage. And I think that is about the manufacturing part of this, bringing jobs back to the U.S., not just jobs, though, but bringing the supply chain, the key components like the semiconductors back to the U.S. Um, Deborah, how how much of that do you think is about U.S. leadership? How much of this is really just about the competition with China and trying to strengthen the U.S. position in that global dynamic? I think it's both. But, you know, we've had a renaissance in advanced manufacturing underway for some years now. Digital manufacturing, but also, you know, the additive manufacturing with new materials. That really all started in the United States. And we see now, you know, aircraft companies being able to manufacture, you know, from the beginning of modeling and simulating a part all the way, you know, through fabrication and looking at the whole life cycle building in energy efficiency and productivity into manufacturing. So that is something that is well underway throughout the country. But what also accelerated it, and this was really um, around 2008, eight nine, was the implosion of shale gas. Because when our cost of energy really became so low compared to our competitors, we saw for the first time in the United States, you know, new new uh, basic industry facilities, whether it was in, uh, you know, I'll just use an example, Dow Chemical and many other steel that we hadn't had new factories built in the United States for years. They were all being built overseas. And the energy equation made a huge difference on that. But in terms of the supply chain and the resiliency, I mean, these, these issues are all also about sustainability and resiliency. You know, we saw in the COVID, how many Americans were stunned and shocked to know even, you know, basic protective equipment we couldn't get into our country. You know, major U.S. companies that had designed, it was all outside. And so there are national security issues for your own people that you have. To have. You have to have the, the feedstock for pharmaceuticals. And so the, the, the pandemic actually, while we don't want to say they're silver linings, but it showed that you have to have resiliency in the supply chains and that everything cannot be designed and produced around cost. It has to be around, you know, what is actually the interest for the country and the company. The the semiconductor issue is huge. And I just want to comment on that. And I, I was very, very pleased that the president mentioned and had the CEO of Intel um, at the State of the Union because the United States has to lead in the design and the fabrication 
at scale of next generation microelectronics. It's the foundation for everything, autonomous systems, AI, et cetera, et cetera. And we allowed so much of that to move offshore that we lost also the ability to manufacture it. So this is another example where these things all come together. They're both domestically critical, but they have huge national security implications as well. And, and in, on, on many levels, you, you mentioned the, how the pandemic kind of forced us to, to think about the footprint of the supply chain. But in some ways, that assessment was already happening because of the trade war with China and the realization of just how much of U.S manufacturing or for products sold in the U.S. were being done in China. Um, uh, Mr. Ramaradan, I want to bring you in. I'm curious to get your thoughts on this because yeah. the three of us are here in the U.S. Um, certainly, this is a conversation that is happening on so many levels internationally. But when you look specifically at the Biden administration's policies and this real focus on bringing things back to America, do you see that is strengthening the U.S. position or is that the U.S. just turning inward further? I think it's a great question. The whole area will compartmentalize into three uh, possibilities. One is the advanced manufacturing, whether it's in the semiconductor, robotics technology, where the supply chain disruptions and the worry about the technology leaking to undesired locations is one part of it which is getting addressed on a global basis. Second, the innovation ecosystem which is now thriving not just in one country, namely the US, it's spreading to multiple locations across the world. So we cannot afford to ignore the innovation which is going to be feeding into the supply chain in a collaborative manner. Third is the sustainability issues, namely the climate change related and the disposal of waste, etc. is taking again a global stage because of the COP26 which happened and the kind of commitments each of these countries have given. So you cannot rule out collaboration and a collaboration is a must if you want to look at EVs or the automotive where renewable energy is going to play a part, the mobility is going to take a completely different dimension. Semiconductor is used as the leadership, robotics maybe the US as a leadership. But at the end of the day, it is going to be a world where some of the collaborations are going to be very pronounced. The uh, supply chains will not completely get disrupted in terms of only a supply chain within a specific country. But I think the uh, divide between the you don't want the technology to go somewhere because of the cyber security threats, because of the intellectual property threats. But to me, the world is going to be needing the collaboration because when you do the innovation, whether it's the machine language, automation of software, the advanced uh, national language processing of the artificial intelligence, the universities and the academic institutions play a very critical role in the global collaboration will happen. How to protect your technology for the wrong use or being uh, stolen is a problem which needs to get addressed as we move along. But the supply chain disruptions were visible during the COVID, but that is getting addressed faster than anything mm -hmm. else. So there'll be uh, backup locations, multiple locations. The last option available to all the countries is you can go and set up a plant in the US today. You can go and set up a plant in Germany today or in India today. And that is going to be always there, but with the political system overlaying on top of it to make sure the governance model is a lot more pronounced than any time we have seen in the past. But I think uh, the semiconductor shortages again is playing out as we even speak today. With the result, we are not able to satisfy the demand. And if the demand doesn't pick up, the global economy is going to get a serious mm -hmm. uh, joke. So I think out of balance between all these factors, it makes it more exciting because people like us who are innovators or who love to participate in any part of the world, the opportunities are to be looked at rather than uh, problems or creating problems for ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's summarized. I, I want to get to one question in the limited time that we have. And this comes from Lee Shu, who says, how will the new economics, remote workers, crypto community impact the current sovereign government power structure? Will the government uh, collective as one group lose the control? What does that power structure look like in the new tech age? There's a, there's a number of threads that's in that question, but I think it is about 
what we are seeing, at least on the tech front, this this idea of wrestling power away, sort of decentralizing things. How does that shake up the world order? Does it shake things up? Deborah, you want to tackle that question? Or Zoe, you want to take the question? Well, I just want to make one comment, which is that uh, when I talked at the beginning about uh, our intentionally looking at how markets might develop so that they are inclusive um, and provide shared economic benefit, this is this is one of the virtues of some of those kinds of things, because um, if we and for sustainable business models, so we don't later respond, you know, using antitrust laws to break up companies or, you know, whatever, because of the concentration. I think there's a lot of business interest in what kinds of models can uh, use distributed networks, distributed information to create greater uh, shared economic gains. And um, so I, there may be, you know, some of these issues that are of real concerns, but we can harness them also to um, benefit. Deborah, I'm going to give the last word to you. Yeah, I, I think we're on the cusp, you know, throughout the world of this. We're in the age of innovation. But we all live in communities. We have our families. We have our value systems. And we're seeing increasingly that while, and I mentioned the importance of place-based innovation, but at the same time, we're going to engage and collaborate globally. I do think that we're not going to emerge into a world it's sort of the wild west of, of the digital autonomy. I mean, already, you know, the, the issues around cryptocurrency and money laundering and all of that. And we're actually seeing how when the global banking system comes together, it has a huge impact on what's happening, you know, in, in Russia, et cetera. Um, I also think that on the dark side, and, you know, there's always the, the light and the shadows as one of my Dear Japanese colleagues, uh, Koji Omi always said, the dark and the shadow, light and the shadows of technology. There, there are dark shadows in the digital world. We see, you know, digital control um, linked to control of people's genetics. These are very serious things that have huge ethical implications. And that gets back, you know, to leadership of countries that have like-minded values and want to ensure that we're working together for global prosperity. Yes, our own countries. And I think the United States is very committed to that with our allies and partners around the world. So I'm, I'm not one of the ones who thinks we're going to have this um, tech uh, autonomy that's going to operate completely outside of the norms of human civilization. Well, we're going to end it on an optimistic <laughs> note. I think that's an optimistic note, right? We don't want tech taking over everything. I <laughs> appreciate you all joining us uh, today. Zoe Baird, S. Ramadori, and Deborah Wentz-Smith. Um, good to have you on today. And thank you, all of you, for joining us on this Thank you so much. for your great job moderating. Thank yes. you. All the best. Bye-bye.